Hey everyone, and welcome to Prime Comments, episode one. Uh, this is a show I'm going to attempt to make weekly. Uh, my goal is to hit on every Sunday, where I look back at the previous week's worth of videos I created, I re-comment on some of the topics that I brought up, and I look at your comments, pick out at least one comment from each video, and respond to it. I always say here at Nintendo Prime that it's all about the discussion, it's all about the opinions, not just mine, also yours. This is a chance for you to get heard and for me to respond and continue that conversation. So back, uh, there was a bunch of videos this past week and we're going to start with the Liquidator video, which is the one where I talked about how there is a person that has, or a company, that has hundreds if not thousands of NES classics and Nintendo Switches in a warehouse. Uh, they're a liquidator firm and they might have been selling these off to GameStop and Amazon, which is why you've seen NES classics suddenly available for limited stocks uh, here in July, months after the fact. And uh, Nintendo Talk uh, had this to say about it. Uh, he said, this does suck, but I really don't see the problem. We just need to not buy them and leave the scalpers with a ton of crap they can't sell. It's our fault. Just get the games on the eShop, dudes. And to that I say, I, I, I couldn't disagree anymore, to be honest. Uh, it's never our fault that scalpers exist. I mean, yes, people buy scalp products because they're not available. Uh, Nintendo is really more so at fault than anybody else because they didn't make enough NES classics to meet demand. The fact that demand is still this high for a product that's no longer being made lets you know that Nintendo really undershot expectations. And it, it's actually turned some people off from the SNES Classic Edition. So I, none of this is our fault that scalpers exist. It's just right now, uh, outside of these special deals, apparently, where the NES Classic is suddenly available, you're only going to pick it up from scalping. Scalping is 100% legal in the United States. We are more than able and more than welcome to resell products that we buy and own. Uh, and I'm not actually against that. I, I believe in that, you know, in, in that type of capitalism. But uh, at the end of the day, I, 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 it's not our fault. And as for getting these games in the eShop, uh, some of them you can get, some of them you can't. And none of them can you get on the Nintendo Switch. So I don't really view that as a, you know, an argument here in 2017. Anyways, let's move on to the next video. The next video we're going to talk about is the Amiibo DLC video where I kind of went off on a rant talking about how I do not think DLC is appropriate to be locked behind Amiibo. Basically, this was spurned off by the fact that Metroid Samus Returns has the hardest difficulty mode in the game locked behind the squishy Metroid Amiibo, which is currently sold out. So Philly Man responded to this by saying, I'd prefer a physical item to use on multiple games rather than a digital code locked to one game any day. And to that I say, it's understandable. I think any of us would like to purchase one thing and have DLC unlocked from multiple games. But the problem with this is that that's not what Nintendo's really doing. Uh, you might have small things locked behind it, like the fact that if you bought the Super Smash Bros. Link Amiibo and you used it in Breath of the Wild, you would unlock Epona. And that's all fine and dandy. I, I, don't, I, I don't necessarily have anything inherently wrong with the concept of something you bought years ago still being useful today, but too many times Nintendo's locking the very best content behind the new Amiibo that are hard to get a hold of. And even now, that Link Smash Amiibo isn't exactly easy to get a hold of for some people either. And there was, you know, a time not too long ago when that was the number one selling Amiibo in the entire world. So I look at it as, if that content's locked behind an Amiibo that people can't get a hold of, what's better? For people to be able to get a hold of the content they want to play, or for people to have to buy a physical item that might not be in stock and they might have to purchase from a scalper to get. And I know you can go on eBay right now and get, um, you know, cards made by fans that are, have NFC chips in them and allow you to scan and reprogram them for different Amiibo. And the fact that that solution even has to exist kind of elevates the issue I see here, where content just shouldn't be solely locked behind Amiibo. You want to you let that squishy Metroid Amiibo unlock the most difficult mode in Metroid, that's a Metroid Return, Return of Samus, that is fine. But it should also be unlockable in the game. And if not unlockable in the game naturally, like it was in the original, then you should let people spend a couple bucks digitally and get that difficulty. 
the fact that there are people day one that aren't going to be able to play the difficulty mode because they can't get their hands on the amiibo, that's my exact issue with locking amiibo behind DLC. So, yeah, I, I like that they're useful over time, but that shouldn't be the only way that you can get that content. Returning to another video from this past week, we have the SNES Classic pre-order video, which essentially talked about the fact that the SNES Classic is going to be available for pre-order later this month, officially announced by Nintendo on Twitter. And bloody underscore fatality responded to this by saying, I want an N64 Classic Edition next year. Any tips for me? Um... For starters, they have to announce it. We don't know that there's going to be an N64 Classic Edition next year. Although what helps your case is that Nintendo did refile the patent for the N64 controller, which if you, you know, if you think about you know, a logical progression, they had the NES Classic last year, the SNES Classic uh, this year, next year could be the N64 Classic followed up by the GameCube Classic, and maybe even a Wii Classic uh, and... At some point, I think they're going to release a Game Boy Classic as well, and maybe a Game Boy Advance Classic, and even a DS Classic, if you can believe it. Uh, I think these are all things that Nintendo is just going to do over the next 10 to 20 years. Uh, any tips for getting it are the same tips I would say for in SNES Classic. You just have to really hawkeye your favorite retailers. Uh, and personally, I don't prefer things that you know are probably going to sell out through pre-orders, pre-ordering online, because every single outlet that you could pre-order from online has had issues in the past with maintaining pre-orders and having to cancel pre-orders. Uh, I always prefer to do in-person, in-stores. So my suggestion is, uh, as soon as you know when they're going to be available for pre-order, go wait outside the morning before the store that you would like to get it from opens, walk inside, and put a physical pre-order in person. Uh, that is what I have done with every product that I wanted to get day one, and it's worked. I was able to get the special edition of Breath of the Wild. I was able to get the Nintendo Switch day one, all because I went in person the day that pre-orders were going to be available. Now, I will note, I wasn't able to get the master uh, edition of Breath of the Wild with the statue because they didn't make those available for pre-orders in stores. I, I don't understand why. Uh, but that's more of an anomaly. That's usually not the case. It's very rare for them to be online exclusive pre-orders like that. Uh, but yeah, I mean, if it's an online exclusive pre-order, you just kind of got to get lucky. But uh, yeah, that's that, that's how I do it. So hopefully that helps you out if and when the N64 Classic Edition happens. Returning to the Switch battery situation uh, video, one thing I want to note before I get into this comment here uh, is that there are times that when I report on something, the information I'm working with on this report may not be correct. And in this case, I was talking about the battery bug that's happening on Switch where the battery will literally discharge, at least in the software, from 100% to 0% really rapidly. Sometimes within five minutes, sometimes a half hour, sometimes an hour. But yet the system would still work for hours on end. And Nintendo's suggested fix included updating the OS and then running a bunch of power cycles. And I commented that uh, doing this can actually negatively impact the battery life. And I wasn't 100% wrong, but uh, I might have exaggerated a little bit the impact that it has on battery life. Uh, a lot of people said that I said it would kill your battery. Uh, maybe I did say those words, but uh, <laughs> it was more of an overtime effect. Uh, doing this to any sort of battery does shorten the lifespan, but the amount that you're going to see the battery lifespan shortened is probably not that noticeable if you only have to complete this procedure a handful of times right now to fix the issue. So uh, I was wrong in, in making people maybe believe out of fear that uh, this was going to harm your battery, but I still stand by the fact that if this is happening to your Nintendo Switch, Take advantage of your manufacturer's warranty. Let Nintendo deal with this. That You shouldn't, at, at the consumer level, uh, need to do any of this. And besides, the fix sounds like it could take many, many, many hours of your day uh, to get right. And by the time you do it, you probably could have sent it to Nintendo and got the system back anyways. Uh, but here is what Schofield117 had to say on this topic. Uh, five or six deep power cycles will have no real effect on battery life. It will not kill your battery. Having to retrain the battery monitor is fairly common. I've done it numerous times with cell phones over the years. And to that point, I'll just say my experience with cell phones is generally about six months after I get my cell phone, the battery does not stay charged for very long. Um, and that's not just the battery percentage thing. When my battery percentage thing hits zero on my phone, my phone dies. <laughs> so it, it's literally the battery is just not holding a charge for as long as it did when I first got it. So, you know, when someone says they have to do this many times on their phones, it, 
I don't know what to say. My, my experience with smart devices is that phones continually get worse within that even first year that you have it. Um, I've never, the, the, uh, this is why I almost want to upgrade my phone every year because by the time the next version of the phone comes out, I'm lucky to get, you know, a few hours of a day out of one full charge on my phone. Uh, because of this, I actually own several different battery banks just to make sure my phone uh, stays charged throughout the day. It, it's a little ridiculous, to be honest. Um, and right now, I presently use an iPhone 6S Plus, so, you know, it's a couple years old now. And you can imagine it's, it's pretty bad today. You know, even recording this video, I have it plugged in to a battery charger because it, it cannot keep a charge very well. Now, uh, but as I did admit, you know, you are correct that uh, it shouldn't massively adverse the battery life. Uh, I am of the belief it will impact it, but the impact is going to be so like unnoticeable to the to people's general use cases that uh, it's probably okay to do this. If, if you prefer to battery cycle and, and solve this yourself because you don't want to send it into Nintendo, be my guest. Um, just note that, as I said, I personally just would not do that. Take advantage of your warranty. That's why you have it. Let Nintendo fix the problem for you. We uh, had a video earlier this week talking about Resident Evil Revelations 1 and 2 coming to Nintendo Switch, and David Digon had this to say about it. I want RE7. Revelations didn't interest me as much. And I will say, I think we all want Resident Evil 7 on Switch. Uh, I remember the old rumors that Resident Evil 7 was running on Switch, that they were trying to get the VR version of, of Resident Evil to run on Switch. And through all those rumors, we were able to dig up patents of the Nintendo Switch that showed that Nintendo actually did at one time conceptualize like a VR headset that you could, you know, slide your Switch into uh, and in enjoy, you know, kind of a Samsung VR VR kind of VR experience. But um, I don't know that that's ever really going to happen with Switch. Uh, but I just because the screen quality at 720p, uh, you really want 1080p, if not 4K, uh, when you're looking that close at your screen. But setting all of that aside, I, I agree. Resident Evil 7 would be fantastic. And I do think because Resident Evil 7 performed so poorly despite having massive critical reception, that if Revelations 1 and 2 does decently on Switch, I could see it being an early port job to Nintendo Switch next year. After all, we have a pretty packed slate this year, so it would be nice, you know, if next spring, maybe a year after Resident Evil 7 initially launched, it hits on Switch and maybe even sees a second life because I know that Capcom invested a significant amount of money into Resident Evil 7 and they were not happy seeing it only sell 3.5 million copies. So um, I think we're gonna get Resident Evil 7. I think it's coming. I think we just have to be a bit more patient. Moving on. There was an Ubisoft video I reported on earlier this week uh, about how Ubisoft's engine, Snowdrop, runs extremely well on Switch and could lead to more games uh, from Ubisoft in the future once they use the Snowdrop engine. Uh, you know, I basically infer that you can get Assassin's Creed and other games uh, someday once they switch over to Snowdrop. And Michael Skinner had this to say, You think they'll port Mass Effect 1 to 3 or Tomb Raider 2013 and today? Uh, Tomb Raider 2013 is on Google TV, which is uh, and like an Nvidia Shield TV, which has the same X1 processor. Uh, I don't think they're going to port those games. And, well, let me rephrase. I think they could port Mass Effect Andromeda. I don't think they're going to port 1 to 3 because I think they're trying to put 1 to 3 behind them. Uh, they just had had Andromeda kind of tank, so you could see them try to port it, hoping that the portability factor will bring people back to the game after they make patches and DLC updates. Uh, or you could see them uh, decide that they want to reboot Mass Effect all over again, you know, five years from now. I kind of think Mass Effect's almost in limbo after what happened with Andromeda and, and it not being nearly as good as the original trilogy. And when it comes to Tomb Raider, I really like like the rebooted Tomb Raider, the, both the 2013 version, you know, the new the new series, the two new games they have. Uh, I think they're absolutely fantastic. I don't know that they're going to come to Switch unless Switch is going to get the next Tomb Raider game. If Switch gets the next Tomb Raider game, I can see them bundling in or having a special edition of the game on Switch that includes the other two games, kind of like. You know, when they sold Bayonetta 2 and you could get Bayonetta 1, I'm thinking a situation like that. I don't think they're going to get individual releases on their own as like a testing the waters mentality. Uh, because for them to do that, they have to be willing to commit the new game in the first place. So I'd like to see them commit the new game and then bring those games with that game over. 
Uh, I think that's possible. Barring that situation, barring the new game coming over, I don't think we're going to see Tomb Raider, the, the new series, even appear on Switch. Um, but hey, I, ho I hope I'm wrong. Returning to the Capcom and 2K video. Uh, in that video, I talked about how Capcom and 2K are still kind of testing the waters of Switch, uh, releasing games that uh, are ports and uh, seeing how they perform. Uh, in fact, I, I have a quote from Capcom in there about them using Monster Hunter uh, Double Cross as kind of a barometer for future support. And that literally is like something that's quoted from what they said. Uh, so I wasn't putting words in their mouth. But uh, Enrique Pinero had this the same response. Every company does the same practice, except they do not outright say it and then try to recant, as Capcom does with the Switch. Every company evaluates how they choose to support any given platform on a game-to-game -game basis, based on how their games sell or don't sell. The only difference is that Sony and Microsoft have an install base, while the Switch is only getting started. These statements mean absolutely nothing. If Microsoft tanked all of a sudden, Capcom would be evaluating whether or not to make games for it. Same for Sony. The Switch will continue to keep getting games as long as the games keep selling and the platform does well. And in large part, I agree. In fact, this is one of the first comments I think today that uh, I absolutely do agree with. And to that I say, uh, you make some good points. I, I do think every company does this. They just don't outright say it. And it's the idea that Capcom is openly admitting it that makes it really interesting to me anyways. Because as you said, that's not common. Companies don't normally admit that they're doing that. And I do agree that the reason that Sony and Microsoft seem to always get the support is because their prior generation of platforms performed well. And Nintendo's last generation uh, you know, did not, and the generation before that didn't really cater to what third parties wanted. So Nintendo's really been out of the game you know, with hardware that third parties desire to make games for since the GameCube era. So if it's been a couple generations, then yeah, Switch is going to kind of have to prove itself in order to get those games. games. Now, if Nintendo could consistently get these games moving forward with switch switch 2 switch 3 and whatever they whatever they have come into the future then you might start to see another reshift in the paradigm where people are like well hey look i like having these games to play on the home console and on the go nintendo does it best i'm gonna go with them and maybe i won't pick up the next xbox or the next playstation platform because i know nintendo's gonna have those games the problem is we're not at the point where we know nintendo's gonna have those games switch is still in the prove it mode uh, trying to re rebuild that install base. So I, I agree, you, you make some very valid points. Moving on, earlier this week I made a, a site update video talking about Patreon, talking about the future of everything, and the, I'll have links to all these videos down in the description below. Uh, but in response to the site update video, Adrian Martinez said, I'd love to have an hour-long podcast. Well, how about two? <laughs> I say that because our podcast is rarely just an hour. It's about an hour and a half to two and a half hours. I know that's like a big window of time, but I don't like to put limits on the podcast because I like to see uh, where the conversation is going to lead. If the conversation leads to two and a half hours of goodness, then great. And this came up because I was asking people if they would like to see the podcast in video form as one long segment or continue to see it split up topic by topic, uh, which is what I have been doing you know, almost since the beginning. And there wasn't a single person that said they wish me to continue doing that. They all said, hey, we, we'd like to see you do the long-form podcast. So when I say, um, how about two, that's because tomorrow the video version of the podcast is releasing here on YouTube, and it is an hour and 55 minutes long, uh, one video. So hopefully you guys look forward to seeing that. Uh, if you want to listen to the podcast right now, we have the full audio version available right now today exclusively on patreon.com slash nintendo prime all you have to do is submit five dollars at patreon and you get a day full early access to the audio portion of the podcast so technically our podcast is live right now if if you want to support us and check it out uh this is going to be a tough one so probably the most controversial video i made this week dealt with nick robinson and the sexual harassment case and I'm just going to get to this response because there's a lot a lot of things I could talk about with this. Uh, but Redskid fan had this to say, Unsubbed. Another SJW beta male. I'm sickened. GTFO. Always siding with females before any evidence is out. Females, not all, constantly abuse shouting sexual harassment. 
Most of the time, it's crying wolf. You can't be mad at a man for hitting on a woman. How else do you meet? Celebrities, not that this guy is one, are always using their status to get women. And there is nothing wrong with that. Plenty of women love chasing celebrity. Don't act as if they're innocent all the time. I work around a bunch of women, and they talk way worse than any man that works there. Either way, I wouldn't recommend getting your channel involved with this PC virtual signaling everyone is doing now. Well, I don't know what everyone else is doing. I don't. I, I try to avoid any channels that, that seem to be uh, talking about this stuff because uh, they don't necessarily provide an objective viewpoint. And I admit, maybe I didn't do that. And my one regret with this video, I don't regret making it. I regret that I didn't wait a day because a lot of people were asking me to provide definitive evidence, which was never provided. Uh, and I didn't have it on hand. All we had was accusations from something like a, a dozen women or something. Uh, and so when accusations start piling up like that, it, it, it's really hard to deny that there's obviously something going on because it's highly doubtful these dozen strangers suddenly messaged each other and said, yeah, let's get Nick Robinson because he told a fan to fuck off on Twitter. Uh, I highly doubt there was some big organized effort for that. And now, you know, literally within hours of me posting that video, uh, one of the victims did put up evidence of the sexual harassment. Now, what I want to make clear here is that I don't think that Nick Robinson uh, is as big of a monster as I maybe portrayed him out to be. He didn't rape anyone. Uh, I don't think there's any legal action coming from these allegations. In fact, I never thought there was legal action coming from these allegations because when you look at the surface of it uh, with the evidence that's now been provided, we know that this is the kind of thing we, we see a lot. Uh, essentially, he content the evidence that was provided. That there are images of you know, as people said, they wanted receipts of these supposed conversations. Well, someone provided receipts, and this person, uh, a fan, a, a fan of his, liked uh, a post he put up of a certain T-shirt, and he out of nowhere DM that fan saying, "Hey, do you like this T-shirt?" And she said, "Yeah." And then he said, "Well, would you like to have it?" And she said, "Well, I, I don't live around you." And then she mentioned how. Uh, eventually soon she's going to be around the area that he lives in and maybe they can meet up and hang out and you know the insinuation was you know you know hang out maybe get some lunch and and you know her able to get that t-shirt from him you know or or purchase the t-shirt from him or whatever the case may be and uh he essentially responded with uh, a meme and the meme asked her to send nudes uh so this is, is, I mean, when I'm out at the bars, it's not like I don't hear this all, all the time, you know, hey, show me pics, or hey this, or hey that, or, you know, damn, you're fine, can I grab your ass? And, like, I, I hear these weird things out of the bar when guys are hitting on women that I, I don't think are right, I don't think is appropriate, but I, I can't stop it, and whether or not it's harassment, at least in my mind, is usually up to the individual. I don't think men should talk to women that way, but it happens and some women are okay with it, and some women even talk that way back to men. Now, uh, it's one thing if they're friends and you know each other and you've known each other a long time or you've been dating. Like, there's in-jokes and everything. Like, I have jokes of my fiancé all the time uh, saying really stupid sexual things uh, that we know we don't mean any offense by it and, or anything. But uh, this is the reason that this bothered me, the reason that I uh, have takes issue with this is because it's a person who is contacting a complete stranger in doing this. Uh, and at, at least, I know this is evidence of just one person, but if, if <laughs> where there's smoke, there's fire. And if there's evidence of one, suddenly the other 11 people are now lying. Uh, I, I doubt it. it. Chances are there's a lot more evidence than the, this just happening to one fan. It feels like it's happened to a dozen or more over the years. And the, the thing is, I think Nick Robinson's probably going to land on his feet. I think he's going to get fired from Polygon. Uh, he's probably going to be blackballed. You know, he's not going to get hired by IGN or GameSpot or anything. But I think he's going to be able to launch his own thing because just looking at the reactions to to me finding this disgusting, there's definitely a lot of people that think what he did is fine and okay, and they're going to support him because of it. In fact, arguably, he might ultimately end up, ironically, being better off than he is now on his own venture, making thousands of dollars per month being able to have run his own podcast and spew whatever crap he wants and act as asshole as he wants and get away with it. And admittedly, there's a lot of asshole uh, YouTubers uh, out here that uh, they get away with it too, and that's kind of their thing, and people enjoy it, and, and they're sexist, and they're 
just bullies, and that's fine if you enjoy that content. I'm not going to say that I've never enjoyed content like that before, because I have. I love stupid humor. I watch South Park. Are you kidding me? Like, I watch s some pretty raunchy shit. Um, but when you break it down, uh, it's one thing to enjoy a certain type of entertainment and provide a certain type of entertainment than to literally treat fans like they're there to appease you sexually. And I think that that's where I kind of draw the line with this. Just because there are fans that fawn after celebrities. Like, you know, there's a lot of celebrities that, yeah, maybe they did sleep with a fan because the fan, you know, made their intentions known. They aggressively pursued them. That's a lot different because that's like consensual. That The person's asking for this kind of behavior versus a fan who just liked to post and uh, we're having a conversation about exchanging a t-shirt and turning that into asking for nude pictures. Like that's, I'm sorry. There's, there's a different line there between a fan seeking out a person um, wanting to hopefully advance it to a sexual nature and a person seeking out a fan who never asked for it and starting a conversation really casually and turning it into that. And the whole, you know, as Redskin fan, you know, talked about flirting. Uh, there's ways to flirt that don't involve asking people to send you nude pictures of yourself um, or asking people. Uh, someone else said that he asked them to, uh, uh, to, to meet up so that they could, you know, suck his dick. It's not, it, come on flirting if that's how he flirts he needs to get some real game man let me tell you um i know i'm fat man but it, you see my my, my fiance here i'll throw up a picture of her uh you don't <laughs> you don't have to be an asshole uh to to get it and you don't have to definitely be an asshole like that to complete strangers um it's not illegal what he's doing but i find it ethically and morally wrong and i'm not gonna apologize for it as for me being an SJW and anything else, sure. I mean, I disagree with much of the SJW crowd. I disagree with much of Gamergate and much of the PC crowd. Um, but just because I disagree with a lot of things doesn't mean that uh, I, I don't think we should treat people uh, respectfully, especially strangers, especially fans of, like, your work. It's really weird to contact a complete stranger and just start being that way. Um, I know this has been around since forever, but... Uh, it doesn't mean I think it's any more okay today as I did when I was a kid. All right, moving on. The last video of this week was about Splatoon 2 having some data transfer issues uh, with peer-to-peer -peer connections and it being 30% slower at you know submitting multiplayer data uh, in matches than the original Splatoon. And here's what Bradley Piper had to say. I don't believe there are any shooter games that purely use dedicated servers. It's not the simple answer everyone thinks it is. Dedicated servers are too slow to be used for every single communication in a fast-paced game like Splatoon or Battlefield. Most games with dedicated servers, like Battlefield, only use them for functions that make sense and don't need the speed of a peer to and don't need the speed of a peer-to-peer -peer connection. Saying that you shouldn't pay for Nintendo's online service because they don't use dedicated servers is nonsense. Not every game on Xbox Live or PlayStation Plus use dedicated servers and plenty of people pay them. In fact, they pay more than what Nintendo will be charging. A real reason you shouldn't pay Nintendo for online would be if their communication platform and infrastructure is garbage. And let's be honest, they don't have a good track record. So, obviously this dives into a, a lot of different situations. Yes, not every game on PlayStation Network and or PlayStation Plus and Xbox Live use dedicated servers, and I don't remember ever saying that every game does. Uh, the only games that really do it are either because the, the third-party developer decided to do it or their first-party games or exclusive games to the platform. Uh, and Microsoft is the one that made a bold claim back in 2013 that every single online game on Xbox Live is going to have dedicated servers because of our cloud service, uh, which turned out to be complete hogwash and, and isn't <laughs> at all what has happened in the years since uh but again i think that whole 2013 uh was just a really bad year for microsoft in general when it came to xbox live and xbox one uh they said a lot of really confusing crap that was not true at all um and then you know the next year they they promoted phil spencer and well they, they've been pretty forthcoming ever since uh, i really like phil he's done a really good job over at the xbox uh the xbox office and with the xbox team um, as for any shooters that purely use dedicated servers, I don't know. Off the top of my head, I'm not sure. Uh, if 
when I'm editing this, if I happen to find a shooter that does, I'll, I'll throw up an image of it. Uh, but I, I, it's not necessarily that, that that Splatoon 2 needs dedicated servers. Uh, I was just saying that because the author of the piece that originated that video uh, said that dedicated servers would theoretically provide a much better service. And compared to the way that Splatoon 2 runs right now online, it definitely would probably... It like, there's no doubt in my mind that a dedicated server would do 100,000 times better. Uh, the, the real issue here is that even in peer-to-peer, -peer, Splatoon 2 is bad. It is like one of the worst games. You know, I threw up the graph before. I'll throw it up again. Showing just how bad the connection rate is with Splatoon 2 speed-wise compared to all these other multiplayer games. Even the original Splatoon. So the issue is uh, the way and the speed of the peer-to-peer -peer is not good enough. So, yeah. Otherwise, I, I kind of agree. You know, Nintendo doesn't have a good track record. Uh, I, You know, whether or not the online is worth it. I think a lot of people pay Xbox Live and PlayStation Network because they have to to get online access anyways folks that's going to do it for this edition of prime comments episode one as always folks look forward to our next video starting tomorrow with the podcast and i will catch you guys next sunday for prime comments episode two i am nathaniel ruffle jance from nintendo prime if you like this video you know what to do if you dislike this video hit that dislike button otherwise folks i will catch you in the next one